Hello and welcome to this webinar. My name is Andreas Kasper and I am part of the Heidelberg Engineering Academy in Germany. In this video I would like to give you an overview about the functionalities that your Spectralis offers you for the glaucoma diagnostics. First we'll have a look on the different scan patterns and positions. To assess the thickness of the neuroretinal rim, 24 radial OCT scans centered on the Brooks membrane opening are captured as visualized by the green lines. The minimum distance between Brooks membrane opening and the internal limiting membrane around the optic nerve head, referred to as Brooks membrane opening minimum rim width, BMO MRW, provides you with the true anatomic optic nerve head boundary and the most geometrically accurate measurement of the neuroretinal rim. A BMO centered OCT scan of the RNFL is taken in a circular pattern as visualized by the green circles. To calculate retinal thickness and asymmetry, a single posterior pole volume scan comprised of 61 OCT scan lines, B scans, is taken across the macula and segmented into individual retinal layers. Out of these segmented layers, we can get a thickness map for each individual layer, as well as a deviation map for the RNFL and the GCL. This video shows you how to measure the first glaucoma examination with the Glaucoma Module Premium Edition. The fixation target is set to the nasal position that we can see the optic nerve head. Then the center of the fovea and the Brooks membrane opening are defined by the software and have to be controlled or edited if necessary by the user as you can see in the following images. Afterwards, the 24 radial scans combined with circle scans are performed. The speed of the measurement depends on the OCT that you use. This video shows an OCT1, and if you use an OCT2, it will be more than double as fast. As a second scan, the horizontal posterior pole scan is used to get all the information about the different retinal layers. After finishing the measurement, both scans automatically are set as a reference for the progression and the ONHRC scan shows a warning symbol as a hint to control the BMO points. As we already saw in the video, the reference points in the fovea and Brooks membrane opening center give each patient a unique axis on which both scans are aligned. Due to this axis, each measurement can be perfectly compared to the values in the reference database. Let's start with a closer look on the analysis of the BMO MRW. In the analysis window, we can see the infrared image on the top left and the corresponding OCT to its right. Each of these red points correspond with the position on the left and right hand side in the OCT scan. The blue arrow shows the minimum rim width that is measured by the software automatically from the Brooks membrane opening to the intern limiting membrane. On the bottom left, we can see the Garway Heath sectors that use the mean value of the Brooks membrane opening minimum rim width. And we can see the histogram on the right. The conventional way to illustrate thickness data at the optic nerve head is using a T-SNIT profile. This profile starts at the most temporal point of the disc and proceeds clockwise from the temporal to superior to nasal to inferior and back to temporal quadrants. 
This histogram shows a normal value of a proximal membrane opening minimum rim width value. If you have a very close look, you can see the black line following the mean value of the uh, reference database, the green line. So if you have a more or less parallel followed black line to the green line, then it looks normal. The next one is a hot histogram where we have an amplitude reduction on the temporal side, superior as well as temporal inferior. It doesn't look any more parallel because we don't have these two little humps that we can see in the normal mean value of the reference database. So in this case, we have lower values than we would expect. In the last example, we could start, if we say with a parallel um, histogram that follows the green line, but then it goes down. And at the temporal inferior part, we have a very hard um, drop down. So we have a thinning in this uh, specific position where we could say that the nerve fiber layer at the Brooks membrane opening is thinned compared to the temporal superior part and compared to the reference database. Glaucoma is a progressive disease. Therefore, identifying change over time is an important step in confirming a diagnosis and monitoring treatment efficiency. Establishing if there is any progressive loss of tissue over time is useful supporting evidence. Interrogating the progression in the temporal superior and temporal inferior sectors may reveal a rate of change that is significantly greater than the global average rate of loss. In the analysis window, you can easily see the progression for each measured position. First of all, you can see the position where the scan is taken, so R is right and L is left. The value behind it is the exact value in microns that is measured in today's examination. And behind it in brackets, you can see the difference to the baseline examination. If you use the progression tab, then you get a discontinuous regression line that is combining all the points from the different data when you have less than five measurements. And you always can switch between all the sectors or the, each sector that is interesting for you. If you have five or more measurements, you get a solid line that shows you the comparison of each of the values or the measured examinations. And you get a slope in microns as well as a p-value that shows you how significant these measurements or these um, values are for the progression. The second important information is the RNFL thickness, which we as well get from the ONHRC scan. The analysis of the RNFL profile is similar to the Brooks membrane opening minimum rim width. The greatest difference is that we have two prominent humps in the RNFL measurement. These humps might be flattened if there are reductions, reductions in the amplitude or notches like we can see in focal defects. Sometimes it can happen that the classification of BMO, MRW and RNFL don't show the same results. And here are some possible causes. If you have a value of MRW that is unsuspicious while you have a RNFL measurement that is suspicious, then it might be that there is a non-glaucomatous optic nerve atrophy or that like in this case we have an atypical position of vessels or that the glaucomatous micropapilla lets the MRW value look more or less normal. Therefore it's important to check the fundus photo or the infrared image. The other way around might be that you have MRW that looks suspicious and the RNFL measurement that is unsuspicious in normal value and there is only one possible cause, a physiological micropapilla. Here as well, the fundus photo is quite helpful. And just to let you know, as an important or a quite important value, the mean of the reference database for the Brooks Brain Opening Center is 1.78 um, square millimeters.
And you always can see the Brooks membrane area at the bottom right in your infrared image. And if you have suspicious and unsuspicious values that you cannot combine, then it's always important to analyze the thickness of the ganglion cell layer. Let's take a step away from the optic nerve head and see what we can analyze around the macula using the posterior pole scan. The posterior pole scan is a defined scan that has an additional thickness map. The standard thickness map is optimized for retinal detachments and so its scale varies from 0 to 800 microns. The posterior pole thickness map is optimized for structural changes caused by glaucoma and therefore has a range from 200 to 550 microns. Ideally, the posterior pole thickness map of a normal eye looks like the wing of a butterfly. The thickness map is not the only tool that the peephole analyzer offers you because asymmetry is a hallmark of glaucoma as well. The full retinal thickness asymmetry analyzes quantifies imbalances between the inferior and superior macula, as well as between the left and the right eye, serving as an aid in identifying potential glaucomatous change damage. Always be aware that the peripheral squares might not give you the best information, because in these areas we have a lot of very large and asymmetrical um, vessels. But you should never only trust in the hemisphere asymmetry analysis, because this case perfectly shows that we don't see any asymmetry in this advanced glaucomatous eye. Like you might know from the retina analysis, you can easily compare follow-up examinations with each other and see differences in the individual thickness map, and even better in the change map on the bottom. Another very helpful information is the segmentation and their thickness maps of the individual retinal layers. In this case, we can perfectly see how glaucoma affects the RNFL and the GCL compared to a normal eye. Based on these segmentations, you can use a brand new function with your GMPE, the deviation maps. The deviation map tab includes a thickness map thickness deviation map and classification chart. The thickness deviation maps of the total retina, RNFL, ganglion cell layer and inner plexiform layer reveal regions and patterns within these retinal layers that have significantly thinner or thicker measurement values when compared to eyes included in the reference database and highlight areas that are not within normal limits. Research has shown that the human brain perceives changes in the lightness parameters as changes in the data much better than changes in hue. The thickness maps utilize a perceptually uniform color scale based on the range of values from the reference database. This color gradient offers the most visually accurate and easily perceived representation of the thickness of each retinal layer. These perceptually uniform color-coded maps may make structural changes clearer to the human eye in comparison to thickness maps with the standard hues color scale. Thicker areas are indicated by white and warm red-yellow colors, while thinner areas are indicated by cool blue colors. The reference database derived thickness deviation maps color code the thickness values of a given layer to highlight whether they are within normal limits, borderline or outside of normal limits, making the regions and extent of structural thickening or thinning clearly discernible. Red and yellow areas represent percentile values of less than 1 and less than 5% respectively, while blue and purple areas represent percentile values of more than 95 or more than 99% respectively. Please note that it is common to see blue and purple colors due to the, rep to the presence of blood vessels. Green areas represent a percentile value between 5 and 95% that we would call as normal value, 
And now let us see how it looks in the classification diagrams. The six sector Garway Heath grid is anatomically aligned with the reference database using the APS and the results are displayed as a classification chart. The grid has been optimized for GCL thickness, so there is no RNFL color-coded classification chart. This is because the RNFL is anatomically thin in the macular region, which limits the reliability of measurements in this location and because RNFL defects are typically most prominent beyond the confines of GCL optimized grid. Here we can see that the RNFL is selected in the deviation map tab. We have a mid blue thickness map and a bit, little bit of lighter blue over here. That means that in this position we have a little bit more nerve fiber layer than in the corresponding superior part. And we can as well see the same in the deviation maps. So we have a lot of red information on the superior position. That means that most of the nerve fiber layer is gone. In the bottom it's not that dramatic, but we have a, um, a high loss of nerve fiber layer in the position of the nerve fiber layer bundle and the same position if we have a look or the same information if we have a look on the whole retina. On the whole retina we already see some um, thinning on the position where the ganglion cell takes place but we'll see later on more and we don't have any classification because we have the RNFL selected and the classification of the Gaway Heath sectors for the whole retina shows us that, that the bottom position looks quite okay but what we just saw before the Gawa Heath sectors for the center of the macula is optimized for the ganglion cell layer. So therefore we have a look on the ganglion cell layer and in here we can see um, similar information. The information on the inferior part of the ganglion cell layer shows a little bit um, yellow and, and red information. On the top we have more or less only blue. That means if we have a look on the deviation map a high loss of ganglion cell on the, on the superior part and a little bit less on the inferior part. Same information for the retina that we had before because it's the same eye and the classification shows perfectly the same information or the same um, categorization like we had in the deviation map tab. It is mandatory that the APS is defined correct. If there is a shift in the macular center or the axis, the whole map is compared to wrong values and may lead to misinterpretations. Like you can see over here, the position that is marked with the green arrow is the perfect fovea position and the green line shows us the position where the um, fovea center was marked before the measurement was started. And this little shift leads us to the misinterpretation that we can see over here in the deviation maps. In a little case study, I would like to show you briefly how you can combine all the previous analyses. This 26-year-old female patient with a primary open ankle glaucoma shows a temporal inferior defect of an RNFL that we can see very good in the fundus photo as well as we can see the disc hemorrhage of the inferior position of the optic nerve head. The 24-2 and 10-2 visual field already show some defects in the top left position and the multicolor image as well as the infrared image show the same findings like we had it before in the um, fundus photo. If you take a closer look in the multicolor image then you can see that there might be a loss of RNFL tissue on the superior position and with a very close look as well in the infrared image. If we go to the analysis of the Brooks membrane opening minimum rim width, then we can see that the segments of the um, analysis over here show us a position that is outside of normal limits and borderline position. And if we have a closer look on the more important histogram, we can see the same. So we have 
superior a defect that we just saw in the multicolor and a very clear defect, a very low value on the temporal inferior position that we already saw before in the, uh, in the segments of the, hist uh, the diagram. Same findings in the RNFL circle scan in the 3.5 diameter. We have the segment that is outside of normal limits and we have a clearly um, detachment of the nerve fiber layer over here where we can see that this hump that we would expect in a normal eye is totally gone and we have a very hard notch over here at the temporal inferior position. Next step from the optic nerve head to the macula is the asymmetry analysis and we can clearly see that the nerve fiber bundle defect is very good visible in the posterior pole map as well as in the hemisphere asymmetry. If we go into the segmentation of the RNFL and ganglion cell layer afterwards we can see the same findings. So we have very warm colors on the superior part but we have less warm colors on the inferior part. That means that all these areas are way thinner than the ones on top. And the same finding on the ganglion cell layer. So we don't have this donut shaped or bagel shaped information that we would like to have. And we have them notching on the peripheral position that we don't want to see in healthy eyes. If we take a closer look on the deviation map, we can see that the thickness of the superior um, nerve fiber bundle is quite okay in this position, but we can see the darker blue nerve fiber bundle defect in the thickness map, as well as we can see that the nerve fiber layer in the deviation map is way outside normal limits. And the same findings in the ganglion cell layer, the position that we just saw that is not normal in the deviation map, uh, in the thickness map, sorry, is clearly visible in both thickness and deviation maps. And if we have a step beneath the ganglion cell layer, we can check the inner plexiform layer as well. And there we can see a little bit more tissue or a little bit more information like we see in the ganglion cell layer, but more or less the same finding. We already have a loss of inner plexiform layer um, in the temporal inferior part. The GMPE hood glaucoma report combines and organizes the most pertinent OCT data from the optic nerve head, RNFL and macula for detecting glaucomatous damage and empowers you to relate this information to visual field data in a clinically effective manner. The disadvantage of the T-SNIT profile is that making a comparison between RNFL damage and visual field defect is challenging considering that most of the retinal ganglion cells are located in the macula. The GMPE hood glaucoma report presents the RNFL data using an SNTIN RNFL profile. This profile starts at the nasal most point of the disc and proceeds counterclockwise. For your printout, you can always choose for the field view position if you would like to have the thickness map or the deviation map as a printout option. For a more comprehensive guide to diagnostic imaging for glaucoma assessment, including 29 case studies, purchase the Glaucoma Imaging Atlas. If this video was too fast for you or maybe some information are missing, then these two brochures, the Glaucoma Toolkit and the How-To Guide for the GMPE might be very helpful for you. In these two brochures, we combined all the information that I just showed you and give you very detailed and short information about how to use the software. So to summarize, we can say that the Spectralis Glaucoma Module Premium Edition provides you with a comprehensive set of parameters for the assessment of structural loss that is characteristic of glaucoma. This multimodal approach empowers you with a toolkit to evaluate both routine glaucoma patients 
and those who present with the diagnostic conundrum. The result is accurate, objective glaucoma care that is personalized to you and your patient. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Stay safe and have a good day. Bye.